essential that all who plan and engage in military operations in terrain where the threat of avalanche danger exists have a full understanding and appreciation of this environment. Anything less is a clear invitation to disaster. Let us assume that a reconnaissance patrol is being sent out by a unit to gather information relative to the conditions of the terrain over which their unit is to move within a short period of time. The men going on the mission are well trained in the rigors of winter mountain movements. They know that most hazards can be avoided or greatly reduced by practicing a few simple common sense rules. Besides their prescribed outer clothing and equipment, they take with them such items as avalanche shovels, avalanche probes, and avalanche cords. Most military operations in snow-covered mountainous terrain are planned in accordance with existing daylight hours of the particular area. The patrol leader must make certain that his men have all the necessary equipment in good working order before moving out. These men have been conditioned to their environment and therefore move with confidence and with care. The men avoid steep gullies, ravines and narrow valleys flanked by steep slopes. They seek forested areas, rough and broken terrain and high ground because they know these offer the safest possible routes. As the patrol approaches steeper and more critical terrain, the leader confers with his assistant as to prevailing snow conditions and best route to be followed. They keep a watchful eye out for obvious avalanche paths and signs of previous snow slides and wind slab formations. The patrol will change its route, if it can, to circumvent such areas and approach their objective from a different and safer direction. One way to recognize a windward slope is to look for the rough, choppy ripples the wind forms on the surface of the snow. Given a choice, these men will cross a slope on the windward side in preference to the lee side. Windward slopes are less likely to slide 
because not only less snow is deposited there, but the snow which accumulates has the tendency to be compacted by the action of the wind. Portions of the ground of windward slopes may be exposed due to continuous wind action. When the terrain is such that it is impossible to avoid areas of avalanche danger, the men know that specific safety measures must be taken. Ski pole straps must be removed from wrists to guarantee unrestricted hand and arm movement. The straps of the ski bindings must be loosened to ensure the quick removal of the skis should this become necessary. And finally, the men employ their avalanche cords in the prescribed manner, stringing them out so they will trail behind. The bright red cord is light in weight, and portions of it have a tendency to remain on the surface of avalanche snow. This can be a great help in locating a victim quickly. The men would take the same measures if they were wearing snowshoes or any other restrictive equipment. For each man has learned that should he be caught in an avalanche, the equipment would hamper any efforts he could make to remain on top of the moving mass of snow. Traversing a critical avalanche slope requires other special measures. Such slopes are crossed as much as possible on their top portion and any natural protection which the terrain may provide is utilized. In the event a man causes the snow to slide, he should attempt to descend diagonally out of the moving snow. Only one man moves at a time, while visual contact with him is constantly maintained. If caught in sliding snow, he must throw off his gear and make swimming motions in an effort to remain on top of the snow. He should also hold his mouth closed to keep snow from entering his respiratory tract. When the snow mass slows down and stops, he should put his hands in front of his face and try to push the snow away to provide an airspace as large as possible and then try to work his way out of the snow. However, his best chance to survive is to be immediately located and rescued by the other members of his patrol. The important thing for an avalanche victim to remember is that he cannot afford to lose his head and panic. When men familiar with avalanches must ascend or descend a slope that could slide, they climb it straight up or straight down using their ski climbers. They avoid traversing the slope diagonally. Or by cutting back and forth in a zigzag fashion, since either of these procedures could provide the shearing action that triggers an avalanche. Each man moves slowly and cautiously to produce the least amount of disturbance in the unstable snow. And each does all he can to avoid taking a fall for the same reason. The men take advantage of every natural protection offered, protruding rocks, ledges, and trees. They would attempt to take refuge behind these obstacles in the event of a slide or cling to them until the snow had passed.
At times, when sections of confined and precipitous terrain have to be overcome, it is safer and easier to climb without the aid of skis. Faced with a problem of this nature, the patrol continues on foot while they carry their skis. They cross a slope of potential danger at its top if they can, or as near the top as possible. Here the chance of being buried by a slide is less. When crossing a ridge, they look for possible cornice formations and keep well on the windward side, away from the probable line of fracture of this dangerous formation. There is no safety rule that men conditioned to snow-covered mountainous terrain practice more faithfully than that which states, the greater the menace, the fewer the number of individuals that should be exposed to it at one time. Another rule dictates that in critical areas of avalanche danger, all unnecessary noise must be avoided for its vibration can sometimes trigger a slide. And finally, in an area of danger, visual contact must be maintained at all times. Nothing is more important than this in the event of an accident. And nothing is more unpredictable than accident. For in spite of all the precautions man will take, accidents will happen. key to avalanche rescue is speed. Realizing that rescue operations will undoubtedly require additional men and equipment, the patrol leader dispatches two men back to camp for help. Another man is dispatched to a safe location from which he can observe the slopes above as well as the rescuers below. His job is to warn the others in the event another avalanche follows from the slopes above or from the sides. The others organize themselves into a search party. The first few moments are critical and every effort must be directed toward finding the victim as quickly as possible. However, nothing must be done in a rush or without plan. Both can only result in wasted time and effort. The first step is to mark clearly the place in the avalanche path where the victim was last seen. 
It is for this reason that constant visual contact in hazardous areas is so important. Once the spot is properly located and marked, rescue operations can start. The men examine the slope for any signs of the victim, his equipment, articles of clothing, his avalanche cord, anything that might be a clue as to where he may be buried in the snow. If any article belonging to the victim is found, the area in its vicinity is immediately probed. Probes are pushed vertically through the snow as far as they will go, but probing is done carefully to avoid injuring the victim. While avalanche probes are special tools designed for the job, a ski, ski pole, or wooden pole, or any similar item can be used in an emergency. Finding any article belonging to the victim can be extremely valuable in the effort to locate him. Using the markers where the man was last seen and where the article was found as points of reference, a line can be visually drawn through them which will indicate generally the line along which the man is most likely to be found. the men continue to examine the slope. They not only search the main mass of the avalanche snow, but its outer fringes too. A human body is bulky and is likely to be carried to the very end and outer boundaries of the slide. Now the rescue team will probe systematically for the lost man. They will start at the tip or base of the slide and move up the avalanche path along the line of reference. In probing, the men form a straight line shoulder to shoulder and the line is kept dressed to avoid skipping the smallest area. Each man probes first off his right foot then between his feet. Then off his left foot. The entire rank takes a 12 inch step forward and continues. The end of each row probed is marked with a ski pole to prevent reworking a section that has already been done. In their rescue effort, the men know that nothing succeeds more than patience and strict adherence to the rules. At stake, they also know, is a commodity we all consider most precious of all, a human life. Now a second sign of the man under the snow is found, his avalanche cord. An avalanche cord is 60 feet long, and each 10-foot section is marked with a metal sleeve. The arrow on it indicates the direction in which the cord is tied to the victim's body. Each sleeve also has a number indicating the distance that sleeve is from the body. In this instance, this sleeve is only 10 feet from the victim.
Finding the cord is of great benefit, for it is evident that the man lies buried only a few feet up the slope. It is difficult to set the exact length of time a person will live when he is trapped by an avalanche. Much will depend on the type of snow holding him and the extent, if any, of his injuries. Rescue operations are always continued until the trapped man is located and brought out. When a probe strikes a human body, it is a different, more yielding feeling to it than when it contacts a rock, frozen ground, ice, or other solid object. An experienced man can detect this difference quickly. Meanwhile, a helicopter bringing a rescue party lands as near to the location of the accident as the terrain will permit. The advantage of the helicopter, of course, is that it can quickly return and bring more assistance should that be required. Once the man is found, he is brought out very carefully to prevent further injury and is transferred to a place where he can be given first aid. The first step in caring for an avalanche victim who is unconscious is to make certain that his breathing passages are not congested by snow inhaled during or after his fall. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation is applied if necessary while others may aid in treating the person for shock, exposure, and frostbite by making him warm. Once the man is revived, any wounds he may have should be dressed and any broken limbs should be supported by splints before he is evacuated. In short, every effort must be made to keep the man from further injury and shock. This man will live. He will live because he was found in good time. He will live too because of his own know-how and the know-how of the men around him. he will be evacuated to camp for further treatment. His companions, of course, will go on to complete their mission. Soldiers equipped with the tools and know-how can not only overcome the hazards that nature creates, they can use these same destructive forces against their enemies. In snow-covered mountainous terrain, every trained soldier is actually in an excellent position. The odds are very heavily on his side.